Hello, my name is Johan Palmberg and I'm the great-grandson of Astrid Lindgren. This room is more or less the sort of uh, hanging out room for the family. And later when Astrid lived here alone, which she did for quite a long time, it became the place where she would greet, you know, the authors that she worked with or the illustrators that she worked with or when journalists came, they came to this room and when prime ministers and ambassadors came, they would come to this room. So it's more like a, the show of your room because um, uh, close family and, and close friends were always greeted in this a bit smaller room. And I thought maybe I should point out some interesting stuff here. Well, you can see, first of all, that there are loads and loads of books everywhere. Uh, loads and loads of little knickknacks on the mantelpiece. You're going to see this on the mantelpiece and on the shelves. I'm going to see this throughout the whole apartment. Uh, the books are, as far as I can tell, not very well ordered. And I, I got a feeling that there's been a lot of books that have come in and out of this apartment and just been put up wherever they had a, wherever there was a space. Uh, and the same thing with the little trinkets that um, I feel like they were just put up wherever there was room. I remember when we were kids and we were here and we said that we liked something like this. Uh, she would say, okay, take it. <laughs> she would, the next time there would be something else on that shelf. Um, so yeah, so together with that, um, maybe in spite of that, the Royal Library in Stockholm ha has sort of gone through all of the books uh, and all of the little trinkets and marked them carefully and put them in, a, in the very specific place where they were um, when she passed away, which is... Uh, I guess I, it's interesting <laughs> so such care has been taken with it. Yeah. Must have been also terrible for the librarians to have to sort out this very unsorted bookshelf and place everything back in the wrong place <laughs> all the time. Um, and the windows here, you'll see mainly uh, awards, like sculptures that she got from her uh, publishing house. Uh, publishing houses around the world. And she used to say about sculptures that she liked when they were um, as heavy as a bottle of uh, beer because then she could use them to prop up the windows when she was airing out the apartment which was sort of how she felt about how she felt about it works we can go to this corner so these are loads of four editions of Astrid's books uh, and we have many more at the office, but I think now we're up to 107 languages that she's been translated into. And one of the most recent ones was a language called Ani, which is spoken by uh, people in Togo and Benin. Uh, and that came about because two German linguists uh, were there and they started, they created sort of the, the written language or the written, how to write that language from not having a written language uh, to begin with. Uh, and they started giving out this newspaper and because they're German and German maybe even more than Swedes love Astrid Lindgren. They felt that the first book must be Emil in Lundberga. Nothing else is possible. Um, so we have that distinction now as well. Other countries who are even more um, Fascinated with Astrid and Swedes. And uh, this corner here we have uh, the blue bowl you can see here. Uh, I think it's made in the, with the gel technique, which is a Russian uh, making of these kind of things technique. And uh, this was a gift that she got when uh, Boris Yeltsin came on a state visit in the 90s. Uh, and he had specifically re requested to see Astrid when he came here. Um, and I've been to Russia in work, and it's very clear that for for Russian people, Astrid is uh, more of a magical being than an actual person. <laughs> so when you show this apartment to show to Russian journalists and things like that, and they cry the whole way through because she's so important to them. Um, I think it's mainly because 
and it was an um, animated, two short animated films about Carlson on the Roof, uh, which became incredibly popular. They were made by the Soviet animating a production company and they were sent out on Soviet television. I think uh, one of the few really one of the few programs that were aimed specifically at children that were shown there. So people get very excited about Astrid. <laughs> and when when Yeltsin was here uh, it, like, it was big news that, Ast that he had asked to see Astrid. Uh, and people started to write to Astrid and tell her to sort of bring this up when you meet Boris Yeltsin and you have to talk about this. Uh, and what happened then was they met at some sort of grand luncheon at, uh, at Grand Hotel. Uh, and the story is, I don't know if this is true, but I've heard the story, was that Astrid was at that time, and she was in her 90s, she couldn't hear very well, she couldn't see very, see very well, so you always had to sort of bend down and scream your name when you met her because she was so... So I'd say, Astrid, you want? And she would say, hey, you want? And she would like sort of pat me on the cheek. Uh, and the rumor is that she was so blind and deaf and he was so drunk that they didn't realize that they met each other <laughs> because they were both the sort of person that everybody went around to shake hands with. <laughs> so she didn't have a chance to, uh, um, to speak to him about that. But the newspaper headline next day was, uh, Yeltsin got to meet Astrid, <laughs> not the other way around. Yeah, that's so, yeah, it. <laughs> it's recent. Every time Russians, I think Regina Spector was used here. She's half Russian. Uh, she said from stage, like I've been looking for Carlson merchandise all over. I can't find any Carlson merchandise because they can understand that Carlson is not very popular in Sweden. Most people dislike Carlson. Well, it's interesting because I, I, Carlson is my favorite, or was one of my favorite when I was a child, and I think still think it's the the funniest book <laughs> that she wrote. Uh, I think what it is about him that, that I like is that he is, he is very funny and what he does is very funny. And what I think is clear, very clear in the books, maybe not as clear in the film, um, is how much Lillebror sees through what Carlson is doing. And he feels that it's worth, I know what he's doing, it's worth it for me to see this or to sort of handle this whiny baby essentially yeah. because he's so much fun and I get to experience so many different things with him um, but yeah the thing about him being so mean is off-putting to some people um, so he's not yeah he's not on the most popular list but I think that's also a bit the film that came out I, I love the film but it, it has this sort of uncanny valley effect of this child in a bald wing mm. being dubbed by a grown man yeah um, that feels very off to some people. Uh, well, I think it's really funny. Um, so this room, when the family first moved here, this was Astrid's son, uh, Lasse's room. Uh, and then when he got married and moved out in 1950, it became uh, his sister Karin's room. Karin is my grandmother. Um, and when she moved out in 1958, this became Astrid's study, where she she didn't author her books here because she did that in bed, uh, lying down. She would wake up at like five or six and uh, write her books in shorthand because she was a trained secretary and she knew how to write shorthand. It looked like this. This is an actual shorthand um, what do you say? notebook uh, from Astrid. And then she would sit at the typewriter and type it out which could go very quickly. Um, and the rumor is because she was sort of, um, she was head of children's literature at her own publishing company, which is uh, a bit frowned upon nowadays, but um, I think then as well, um, that she would just, nobody would edit her books or have any say about them. She would send them straight to the, to the printers. Um, and so this was her study to write up books, but mainly to, uh, handle her correspondence and I think she wrote she wrote loads and loads of letters and she received even more. In the Royal Library now they have the Astrid Ingrid collection which is her saved letters. I think they asked her to start saving letters quite early and sent to them. 
uh, and that is, and we might have to double check this number, but I think it's 250,000 letters that have also been <laughs> gone through by people uh, to see what is what is in there. Uh, so loads of that, she would handle her own rights uh, from quite early on. So she would write contracts with uh, other publishing houses and she, with film companies and with theater companies. Um, so she, at that time, when she was in her prime, she would be writing the books, handing the rights, writing the theater plays and writing the film scripts uh, uh, by all this by herself. We are, I think, 18 people now handling her rights. <laughs> it's a bit strange that she had the time to do it. And my grandmother says that she never saw Astrid work, which I think find highly unlikely. <laughs> but it's, that's her memory of it. But maybe it's because she worked a lot in bed and she worked part-time also at the publishing house. So 50% of the time at the publishing house, 50% of the time, the rest of everything that she did. And she was also a, a single mother for, uh, to Karin for at least yeah, five years, six years. So yeah, it's, it's a strange thing how she had time. And you can see here that the letters became overwhelming after a while. Because for quite a while she had a rule for herself that she would, um, rip each child that wrote to her would get a letter in return, at least one. And uh, she kept that up for quite a long time. But then I think this is, she started printing out these uh, cards because uh, it became too much. So this I think is after her 75th birthday. And she says, Hey, oh hi, hey, okoy, <laughs> all kind people who have remembered my birthday. Uh, I would really love to write a personal letter to each and every one of you, but then I would have to keep going until my 80th birthday and that would make me dizzy. Uh, thus, I ask you all, large and small, to receive my warm and heartfelt thank you, even though it's uh, given to you only with this lousy little card from your uh, tilgivna, dedicated Astralinia. And there's a, a rump hope there. Uh, from the Ronya books. Yeah. So I think when she when she turned eighty, I think she had fourteen sacks of letters delivered here from people to who wanted to congr congratulate her. It went so far that she like she wrote to. She wrote an open letter in the teachers' union uh, newspaper uh, or like their magazine where she said. Dear teachers, I love you, I love what you're doing, please stop asking kids to write me letters, <laughs> because it's too much. Mm. So on this wall here, uh, there's loads of illustrations by her, people who illustrated her books. So if we start here, there's some from uh, the Noisy Village, what have been. I think this is a film poster for Emil. Uh, and then we have some more little black and white Emil pictures. These are made by Bjorn Berg, um, who also illustrated Tegels Gumman. I think it's something that you should uh, look into mm -hmm. in your road to becoming Swedish. Uh, so Bjorn Berg, he would, when, when he was writing letters to Astrid, he would add some drawings at the bottom. So then mm -hmm. When she had her birthday, he would make these a bit larger, larger paintings uh, to congratulate her. And it's usually the characters of Emil who are on the way to Vimmerby to congratulate her. Um, then we have some more Elon Wikland. Ilan Wiklan is the one uh, who illustrated the most of Astrid's books. So this is, I think, Sun Naning, or the Red Bird. This is Mio, my son. Also Sun Naning, Mio, and of course, Carlson. And down here and here we have original spy, uh, Ingrid Wagnerman, 
who illustrated Pippi Longstocking and who, yeah, she only did Pippi Longstocking and Kai Skabot. This one right here is the only remaining original from the first Pippi Longstocking book because at that time you didn't really have a sense of what something like this could be worth and like the standard in the publishing industry was that you printed them once and then you used the book to print further editions. Um, but apart from her own illustrators, there's also people who she has inspired or who she has admired. So here is, when Asif was working at Rabena Sjögren, the publishing house, she commissioned Tove Jonsson, who did the Moomins, uh, to illustrate uh, The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. Tolkien? Yeah. So these are the dwarves from The Hobbit. She also requested then an original from her. <laughs> um, up here you can see Alphonse. Uh, this was a gift on Astrid's 90th birthday from Gunilla Bergström, who wrote and illustrated Alphonse. Uh, and I think Gunilla was also at the same publishing house and she, was, she said she was inspired by Astrid. And in this far corner here, Two dogs jumping around, and this uh, this one is by Vare Brolingren, who's not related to Astrid, but has the same last name. Um, who is uh, also a very popular and great children's book author in Sweden. Uh, she received the Astrid Lindgren Memorial Award. Um, I guess it was six years ago now. As the first Swede to receive that. Uh, um, she told the story that she uh, received her first letter of refusal from Astrid. Where she said, change this and this and this. It's not really working right now. And uh, Barbara said that that was the best writing school she, she ever went through. Or all the writing school that she had to go through. Um, and I think also I should point out this. This is Astrid to the left. And on the right it's the old Swedish finance minister. Gunnar Sträng, and this is during the Pompri Possa story. Have you heard about that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, in short, Astrid had to pay 102% taxes, I think, which she felt was uh, a bit much. So she wrote this um, uh, sort of debate article disguised as a fairy tale in, in a newspaper. Uh, where she criticized that and she criticized the Social Democrats. Uh, I think that was a bit, that was a hard time for her because she was a lifelong Social Democrat and she felt that they had sort of gone too uh, comfortable with their power because they had been the ruling party in Sweden for more than 40 years. Maybe not 50, but more than 40, I think. Um, and but she wrote that article and, and uh, it became a big debate. At the same time, Ingmar Bergman was uh, arrested uh, while he was rehearsing uh, a play at uh, the Royal Theatre, uh, which he felt was so embarrassing that he left the country. Uh, and when Astrid had wrote, written this, this story, Gunnar Streng, the finance minister, said, well, Astrid should maybe stick to writing her books because she uh, she clearly doesn't know how to count taxes, which I know how to do. And Astrid fired back saying that maybe we should switch jobs because I know that I have counted correctly and you seem to be very good at telling fairy tales. Of people. Uh, and after that, Gunnar Streng and the Social Democrats uh, were voted out for the first time in, in all four years. Uh, I think that that was sort of a, um, that started a new sort of, uh, what's it called? A new part of Astrid's life where she realized that she had quite a lot of power and that when she talked, people tend to listen. Uh, so after that, this was in 1976, um, she only writes one more book and much of her time is spent 
sort of asking questions from journalists and writing debate articles um, and things like that. Other people also noticed that Astrid had power and that people listened to her. Yeah. So lots of people also tried to get her to join their special calls and also claim that she had joined their special calls when she hadn't. So that was a big thing that she was very upset about after this, that she, in the article she writes, I would gladly pay 80% taxes, just not more taxes than I make in a year. And but many people who were completely against taxes and wanted them to be taken away, uh, all of them to be taken away, except Astrid is on our side, she, she doesn't want this, but yeah. But she was very passionate about <clears throat> the rights of children and the rights of animals. She had grown up on a farm and she, uh, from that, I think, had a deeply seated love of animals and was very disheartened by how they were sort of uh, used in farms at that time. I think it maybe, I don't know if it's worse now, but uh, she, so she wrote loads together with a um, animal welfare um, expert. They wrote lots of articles, which became a book. And then for Astrid's 80th birthday, she got as a birthday gift from the prime minister at the time, um, a, a new law <laughs> called Lex Lindgren or the Lindgren law, um, which was an animal welfare uh, sort of uh, stricter animal welfare rules. Uh, the problem was that he gave her this law before they had debated it in the parliament and things like that. So when they when it was f finished, it was much less than what he had said it would be. Uh, and she said that that was uh, a nasty thing to do, to give a gift and then take it back. She called it thesit, which is a word. I, the literal translation is farty. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it works. Um, and then, of course, uh, the rights of children. So one of her big questions that she talked about and was hotly debated at around this time, a couple of years later at Ponte Posa, uh, was um, corporal punishment. Uh, and it was being debated in the parliament and Astrid, I think in 1978, was uh, given the German bookseller's peace prize. Uh, and she felt great, now I have a big platform to talk about this. So she sent down her speech to the to the prize organization and they wrote back saying, thank you for this. Uh, would you mind only saying thank you and <laughs> getting off stage? <clears throat> and she wrote back, in that case, I think I'll send the ambassador or something because I don't want to come on this. I can't say this. Um, and the uh, prize committee, they changed their mind and said, okay, you can have the speech. And so she held it. It was broadcast live, I think, on German television uh, and became news in Sweden. Uh, and of course, not only thanks to that, but that was part of why Sweden the year after became the first country in the world to make it illegal, completely illegal to ever hit children, uh, which I think she must be quite proud of. And that's still being used now when because the Swedish institutes um, are sort of have taken upon themselves to uh, be a, a leader in that respect. I think it's part of the UN 2030 goals or something that it will be outlawed all over the world by then. And uh, Sweden is sort of going out and trying to um, teach people about this and affect people. So I've actually been to Japan to sort of read from Astrid's speech and tell about how she, what she thought about it, together with like experts from Sweden and things like that. And very happily I learned, I was there last summer and this May they, the, the law went through that corporal punishment is now banned in Japan. And people come here from different countries and we, uh, they, uh, we show them the apartment and tell them about this as well. So, yeah. I think she might have been proud of that legacy at least. But the, the speech is out as a book, if you want to. Uh -huh. I think you can find it online as well. Yeah. <coughs> it's called Never Violence. And the, the rough idea, I guess, was... She was given the Peace Prize, and it was sort of... 
how can I, as a children's author, what is my idea of how to create peace on earth? I think we have to start with the children, and I think um, if we hit children, we teach them that violence is a sort of solution to problems, which it never is and never should be. Uh, this little room is the, uh, I guess it's the uh, part of the hallway, uh, but it worked as the room where they sort of ate and, as I said, where close friends and family were greeted when they came to visit. So I remember when I would come here as a child, Asu would usually be here, usually with someone who helped her to sort of read aloud to her or something like that because she couldn't see very well. And there would usually be also like cake or... Um, Camille Lind, or like cinnamon buns, because she really had a sweet tooth. <laughs> uh, which, yeah, my dad has told me that when he was a child and Astrid would uh, take care of him, uh, what you would get for breakfast was uh, Camille Lind, which is like a long cinnamon bun. Then you get that toasted with uh, marmalade on it, which is a really sort of a sugar rush. <laughs> which I really like that. Um, yeah, and this is also where we would, when the whole family would come here, it wasn't, like, the main, the main event was, um, Anna Yu, which is the 26th of December, which is Boxing Day, um, so we, everybody would come here on Boxing Day and eat, and when we became too many, we would have to be in both of these rooms, but it was this room for as long as possible. This room uh, is so. This room, when they first moved in here, was um, Astrid and her husband Sture's room, where they slept. Um, it later became more or less a room for large dinners and not used for much else, apart from this bed, which was used when Astrid's sisters were visiting. Uh, they would sleep here. Though so Astrid had one older brother and two younger sisters, and she uh, she was very close with uh, with all of them, but mainly with her older brother Gunnar. So I'll show you this. <clears throat> and Gunnar was sort of a could do anything. He was a, a painter. Astrid would you Astrid would say about Gunnar that he was like. Uh, water around stones because he always had to sort of keep moving and keep doing different turns so he had many different interests but he was uh, he was a member of parliament for the what's now the center party but then the farmers party uh, he, when he wasn't when he was on his summer break from that he would write like satirical uh, books about what had happened during the year i tried to read them and they're impossible to understand because they're sort of he puts all of the politicians in sort of a, a Viking age and gives them funny Viking names, depending on what they do. Uh, and they were illustrated by David Carlson on this day, who also did the Pompey mm. Posa picture. Uh, and he was also an artist. He, he didn't want to use uh, watercolors or oil because he didn't have time to let the paint dry. <laughs> so he used the uh, pastel crayons. Mm. Um, so he had that, so, and he was also, <clears throat> he took over the farm where Astrid grew up, um, so he was a farmer as well. So he did that, Astrid became Astrid Lindgren, uh, her little sister Stina became a translator, and her other sister Ingeid became a journalist and translator, I think. So they all became sort of people who worked with words and language, and it's their father, Samuel August, who was a lifelong farmer, said, "It's uh, I, my my kids are really strange. You know, <laughs> this is what this is not why I, what I thought I would get. Uh, they were all raised to work on the farm. I think none of the girls, at least, went to school longer than. I think they stopped school when they were thirteen or fifteen. Um, but for some reason, something in the water or something in the genetic code made them all." Good writers. 
Um, more awards. Awards everywhere, as you can see. So the pictures here of this wall. I always like to talk about. So this is maybe more interesting to Swedes, but this is Astrid's best friend from childhood. Her name is Anne-Marie Fries. She was called Madicken, or Marty as she's called in English, so she was the sort of inspiration for that. And when Astrid moved to um, Stockholm and she got a job at the um, Letter Censoring Bureau during the Second World War, she got her best friend a job there, and then when she started working at Rabena Sjögren, the publishing house, she got her a job there as well. And Marikens daughter, Lena Fris Yedin, grew up to be a translator just like Astrid's daughter. So Lena Fris Yedin has translated, for example, the Harry Potter books into uh, Swedish. And Lena Fris Yedin's daughters, one of them is Jessica Yedin, who is the head of Babel, the largest literature television show in Sweden. And the other is Eva Edin, who is the head of the second largest publishing house in Sweden. So they sort of took over the, the publishing industry of Sweden, these two girls from Vimmerby, the small one. This picture is from Astrid's 80th birthday. Uh, at, um, and it was at a theater and they released doves. It's not a staged shot, the dove actually sat down in Astrid's hand. Uh, and I think the photographer was very happy that he <laughs> had the chance to take that picture. And up here, uh, you can see Astrid together with my grandmother Karin, who is Astrid's daughter. And they are sitting in this bed, which is... This is the bed where Karin, when she was around seven, was... The, uh, she had a, a flu, I think. A very long fever, and she was very bored. She was pestering Astrid to keep telling her stories and like old stories from when she grew up and reading books and things like that. And then one day um, Astrid didn't have anything left to tell. So she said, I, I don't know what to tell you now. Uh, but Karin kept <laughs> nagging her and Astrid said, well, what, sh what should I tell you about? And Karin grabbed from the air the name Pippi Longstocking. She said, tell me about Pippi Longstocking. And uh, Astrid has later said that because it was such a remarkable name, it had to be a remarkable girl. She started just telling the story to Corinne. And uh, Corinne really liked it. And her friends liked it, and her brother liked it, and her brother's friends liked it. So a couple of years later, when Astrid was out walking in the, pub, <clears throat> the park outside, she slipped on the ice and broke her, or sprained her ankle, I guess. And she was had to be in bed for a couple of weeks herself. And it was right before Corinne's 10th birthday, so she decided to write down the script to Pippi and give it to Karin as a birthday gift. Um, and because she felt that so many people seemed to enjoy it, she decided to send it into a publisher, <coughs> together with a note saying, please don't call the Child Protective Services on me. <laughs> I can assure you that my children have not become totally mad by reading this book, which was uh, a concern for some people, because uh, she sent it to Bonjers, which was the largest children's publisher at the time, and still is, I think. <clears throat> uh, and they took a very long time of debating it, because they saw its merits, but it, they also felt it would be too controversial to publish. So they decided against it, and uh, said no. And then Astrid, she um, rewrote the script a bit and submitted it to a competition at this little publishing house who was about to go bankrupt uh, called Rabena Sjögren. Uh, she, she won. Uh, she was a bit lucky because in the jury for that competition was a person called Elsa Olenius who would become Astrid's mentor. Uh, but she was a big fan of Pippi, uh, Elsa Olenius, and she really pushed for it in the jury selection and they made sure that it won. She immediately started um, editing it for publishing uh, and it was it came out I think in November 1945. Elsa Olenius also worked at the Swedish National Radio um, where she would review children's books and she of course gave Pippi a great review <laughs> because they didn't know about what well, they knew about it but I think they didn't care as much about uh, conflicts of interest. So she gave Pippi 
a Ray re review that she then put on the next edition of Pippi. Uh, and she also told Astrid to start writing a theatre script because she was also the head of a children's theatre in Stockholm. So, like, Elsa Olenius was the sort of PR mastermind behind the Pippi success, along with, of course, how, how great the book is. Um, and Pippi was published and it sold out immediately. I think it sold like 20,000 copies in a month or something. Um, and I think it's fair to say that she saved Rabian and uh, And then the next year she started working there. And her books that came out during those first years where she was very productive, I think she wrote at least two books a year at a time, were what was keeping the, the company afloat for quite a long time. And now they are <coughs> the second biggest publishing house for children in, in Sweden. Very much thanks to that, I think. Both her books and her work as a master head of children. <coughs> and this is Astrid's, this became Astrid's bedroom when, in 1958, when Karin moved out, she was the last one in the, no sorry, in 1952, when, when Sture died. Uh, Astrid moved in here, and Karin was in the room over there. So you can tell here that she has stood up on the same spot uh, from 1952 until 2002 when she uh, died. So it's 50 years of, of tear, wear and tear there. Um, and in this room also, you can tell that this is sort of what she liked to have closest to her. So there are three different pictures of her childhood home in Ness, in Smona. So there, and there, and this embroider one. Um, and if you look at the books uh, in the shelf, based on the two lower shelves, uh, you can see what she liked to read in bed. She used to say that she was she would she liked to read like a, a deer in the forest going around picking one bud from this bush and one bud from this bush. So she would read like a couple of pages of there's some Nordic poetry here. There's also some humor. Some history, I think. I think there's a Churchill book here somewhere. Uh, yeah. Oh. No. Some English history. Uh, the Bronte sisters. Um, she said that she didn't really believe in God, but she had a sort of this strong cultural connection to the stories. So she would read the Bible as literature and she was, I think she would also like pray and thank God from time to time. And she said that it's, it's sort of the, rude of me to thank him so much and still <laughs> it doesn't exist. Um, but yeah, I think, I think she was, it was something that she thought about a lot. But she, she liked to re read the Bible and there's also stories of when she would sort of tell the future from the Bible. There was a letter that she writes to a young fan where she says, I'm having huge troubles with this book that I'm writing at the moment. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be a book at all. I can't seem to get the end to work. Uh, but I decided I would look <laughs> look uh, into the future using the Bible to see if it will work. So I will open the Bible on a random page and says, uh, doves are quite important in this book. Um, if there's a dove on that page in the Bible, everything would be fine. And there was a dove on the page in the Bible. Uh, and that book was uh, <clears throat> The Brothers Lionheart, which is not as popular in England, but it's, I think, considered her, maybe her greatest work. Uh, in Sweden, because I would say, like in England, or in the in the English-speaking world at large, it's it's mainly Pippi that's known. Like she's at least ten times bigger than the second most uh, read one. Whereas in Sweden, all Pippi is also the most popular. But uh, there's sort of most children in Sweden have read most of the stories, I would say, or at least seen the films, or are very aware of them, at least. Yeah. 
and this is also the room where Astrid in uh, 2002 uh, passed away after a couple of uh, well, she had a, she had a stroke in 1998 where she sort of lost a bit of her uh, move ability not uh, she had was still sharp but she was sort of slower to move and slower to talk uh, and she I think she had uh, had um, pneumonia at the end she passed away so we all came here the whole family always <clears throat> I remember being picked up at school before it was publicly known that she had passed away and everybody was here and we sort of went in to say goodbye and then during that day it became known who was here I think we were here from yeah sometime in the morning until 12 o'clock or night 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock at night and when we walked out here there was this huge mountain of flowers and cards and uh, toys and things from people who had come from all over Stockholm to sort of pay their respects and say goodbye and that mountain was still there I think for quite some time after that because people came and added stuff all the time um, so yeah it was a bit I remember thinking I was 11 at the time and I remember thinking it was a bit strange that this thing sort of was uh, I felt like it was our thing <laughs> that she had died and it was all of Sweden's thing and there were like shows on the television about it and there was all of the radio was talking about it so I don't think I had really really fathomed how popular and important she was until she died because everybody was everybody came out in support of her which was nice of course but still a bit of a strange sensation finally the best part of the apartment the great-grandchildren put here that's me.